to praise God, um, especially praising God with creation. Um, this evening, the choir will be performing Haydn's creation in the sanctuary at 7.30, and it's a free concert, and it will be amazing. So please plan to be there tonight. Um, and this morning, we hope that you will worship as you feel comfortable, whether that's getting up and raising up hands or sitting down and just calmly taking everything in. Um, we are just very glad that you are here. And let us begin this day standing and greeting each other and saying, good morning, welcome to the table. I waited patiently.
along with me. That was awesome. Um, and this song is called Revelation Song, which I thought was appropriate. Um, but it really talks about, you know, Jesus is at the root of who we are as Christians and who we are living into that new hope. So I invite you to sing with me or just sit back and relax. Um, this is Revelation Song.
we drove to work and to church and to school this past week. Maybe we noticed the greening of the trees that lined our way. Maybe we noticed the beautiful azaleas blooming in the bushes along the side of the road or the roses giving off their heavy scent, or the beautiful iris that lift their delicate petals to the sky. Maybe we saw on one of those cloudy days the hint of sun breaking through. Maybe we saw as we passed whatever body of water we live near, just the reflection of all of creation smiling back upon us. Maybe we saw those things. But too often, oh God, we go about our days driving eyes ahead on concrete, concrete and pavement. So many times, oh God, we don't even see beyond ourselves, but see within our heads to the list that we have running. Got to do this. So many times, oh God, we don't relish the gift of your creation in which you've placed us. Forgive us. And Lord, as we become more and more aware of this beautiful home that you've given us, may we also be reminded that in the beginning you created us to care for this creation. That was our job. That was our purpose. Remind us of our job and purpose so that we might not hurt, abuse, pollute, destroy not only the earth that surrounds us, but even ourselves, for we are a part of this creative gift. Help us to care for one another, for the communities, the old and the new Jerusalem, that are in our midst. Be with those people in places that have felt the harming and the brokenness of creation. We continue to lift up those folks in West Texas and in Boston and, and in Syria and in other places of the world. We continue to lift up our own church members who are struggling with disease and hurt and pain. And we continue to lift up the people whose names perhaps have not been lifted out loud this morning, but whom you know with your loving creator self that you are. For we all are yours, and frankly, Lord, you are ours, and we give all thanks and praise for being evident your creative hand. We give thanks to, for all these things in the name of the one who brings us the promise of new creation, your son, Jesus the Christ. For it is in his name we give all thanks and praise. Amen. In the beginning was darkness and nothing. Your spirit
may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts gathered in this place this day be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. How many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? Raise your hand if you've been to the Grand Canyon. A couple of us have. How many of you have seen a picture of the Grand Canyon before? It's a, it's a pretty amazing place. There were three visitors who went to the south rim of the Grand Canyon. That's in Arizona. And they, they had what most people experience when they step on that edge of the canyon and look at the glory beneath them. They were just in awe and in wonder. Well, not all of them. The first person who stood on the edge was a, was a woman who was an artist. And, of course, her hands itched for her brushes and her oils and her canvas so she could paint the beauty of the place. And, and she said, what a marvelous landscape to paint. The second person was a minister. And the minister's hand itched for his Bible so that he could proclaim the glory of the Lord, and he said, what a marvelous example of God's handiwork. And then he began to quote the scripture from the Psalms, I lift my eyes unto the hills. The third person was a cowboy, and he just stood there and kind of itched the side of his head, and through blazed eyes, he said, what a horrible place to lose a cow. <laughs> Think about that, it would be. So, not everybody feels the same way about nature. Most of us have a connection with it, but depending on our experience, we may not love nature as much as the next person. I mean, I am an example of that. I like to get out and hike and, and camp, and I just think that's a great great place for me, and I, when I'm out in nature, I feel calmed and feel at peace, and nature's embrace soothes me, but I can tell you, uh, when spring comes and I start driving down the street and I see those um, Bartlett pear trees start to bud, I have to say, I, I, it's beautiful, but I start dreading it again because my allergies, I know, are going to make me miserable for the next couple of months, so it's a love-hate relationship with nature. I, 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 back in, in ninth grade, I had an English teacher who first taught me about the various categories of conflict. My English teacher was Mrs. Lehman, and she's been coming to church here upstairs. I don't know if either of you had her at Brian Adams, but she's here. My goodness. Um, she taught me that in literature there are different categories of conflict. Now, when I learned it, it was before we inclusified uh, language, and so um, I learned it as man versus nature was one of the categories. And the, the books, the stories that were written in this genre of literature were like uh, Stephen Crane's um, In the Boat, which is a short story about five men who were sailors who were on this boat when a storm hit. The Perfect Storm is another example of that, when you're, you're battling the elements. Um, Jack London's books, if you've ever read any of his stories about uh, those pesky dogs up in the Yukon and how, how his characters are always find themselves alone out in the freezing cold of the Yukon, uh, man versus nature, human beings versus nature. Now, of course, you and I are considered part of nature, right? We're, we're part of nature, uh, but scholars and literary scholars gave us our own category. This is uh, the human protagonist, the hero, versus the human antagonist. And pretty much every book you read, book of fiction you read, includes this. You have a good guy and a bad guy. You have a hero and a villain. So uh, humankind versus humankind. Now the book of Revelation takes it even a step further. In these conflicts. They put the conflict in the cosmos. The earth and all of creation therein, in the book of Revelation, we see has been infected by a cancerous and supernatural evil. And God and the heavenly hosts are fighting one heck of a battle to try and save it. 
for John, who wrote this revelation. Um, this is not just a work, it's not a work of fiction at all. He is describing in vivid, symbolic language the experience of what life felt like for him as an exile on the island of Patmos in the midst of a time of terror when crazy people ruled the world, when there were emperors like Nero and Domitian who were so unstable, who, who saw life as expendable, um, and who invited their friends and their closest colleagues to come to the, to the arena to see the Christians and others martyred by the lions or by gladiators. And, and it was nothing to see blood and guts uh, strewn all on the floor. And John's community was one of those communities that was threatened by that type of evil and lack of, of, um, lack of, of any kind of heart for life in others. So that's why he's writing this down. Uh, as, as we've talked about in our Wednesday Bible Study class, those of us who are studying this, John's revelation, his, his writing this down, he did it for two reasons. First, he wanted to share the story of what he and his community were going through. He wanted there to be a document to say, this is what's happening to us. And secondly, he wrote it for his folks too, to give them a word of hope and encouragement. Now, those of you who have just heard about Revelation or have studied it maybe in a particular perspective, you may not see anything hopeful or encouraging in the book. But that's the entire purpose of this book. It is a beautiful story of hope and God's love. The word, now, now I have to say this, he did have to write it in code language, symbolic language. Because if he didn't, and somebody from Rome got their hands on this, what would have happened to him? Right. So Jules, how did, how did, our, um, how did our author guide explain the symbolism and the use of symbolism at that time. How, remember, you told me it made sense to you. Well, it drew to a picture of an elephant and a donkey and a tug of war with gifts. Okay? If you see a picture, if we see a picture in our day and age of an elephant and a donkey playing tug of war, we don't have to have a word to know what that means. That's what John was doing when he wrote Revelation. He put in all these symbols that his people, they just knew what that meant. When he talked about Babylon, they knew he meant Rome. When talking about Armageddon, he, they knew he was talking about the time when Rome would be destroyed. So they knew all that uh, by that. So he was, he was writing it for his people and for the people of his time. But I also think this, and we've talked about this too, that John also knew that this message of, of the need for hope and encouragement and for judgment of evil was something that people in all time and in all generations would need to hear. And he's right. The reason why this was included in the Bible, it was not thrown out as gobbledygook writing, was because it, it offered a word of God's presence, both the judgment of God and the hope and mercy of God that people of all generations on into the future need to hear. Just think about other eras in our past since the writing of this book that needed to have the revelation of John as a guidebook for them. Think about um, the people in Europe during the Black Plague when it felt like uh, this, there was this disease that was wiping out the whole world, how they felt that evil um, attacking them. Think about in our own Civil War period, and think about those who were brought over here on slave ships. Certainly, we can call that evil and the need for hope in that time. Think about the folks in Nazi Germany who were in concentration camps 
awaiting the heavens. Evil, call it as it is, waiting for God to come and, and rescue them. That's what the book of Revelation has been given for, to give that hope to people. And, and hasn't it seemed like to you, it certainly has to me, that the month of April in 2013 has been one of those months that just felt like wave after wave after wave of evil has been washing over us. I mean, Syrian leaders gassing their own people. Uh, Kim Jong-un, whatever his name is, uh, threatening a nuclear uh, testing. Earthquakes in China, building collapses in Bangladesh, terrorist bombings in Boston, and industrial explosions in West. These are just a, a few of the things that people are dealing with on a worldwide level that, that we as a world community experience together. And I also know that each one of you may bring today your own personal heart aches, life breaks that are overwhelming to you at this time. So, so I really do want to acknowledge and that what John acknowledged, that, that at times it really does feel that creation, that all of creation has become antagonistic to our sense of peace and well-being. And, and can't we relate to John's feeling that the cosmos is in battle and that sometimes it feels like we in our individual lives are collateral damage in that celestial battle. Sometimes it feels that way. However, though some people who read John's Revelation leave the future of the world, because when you're in one of these times, the, sometimes people feel like the only thing to do is just to wipe it out completely. Just to demolish the whole thing. Blow it all up. That's a scary thought. Because there are some Christians who do preach that. Get rid of it. Get rid of this creation because it is so infected with the cancerous evil, it's not worth having around anymore. I, I want to say this. John does not say that anywhere in his book. In fact, when, he, when we have these images of the beast coming and the dragon coming in, is all of creation destroyed? Never. 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 Just those who who are destructive and break, and, and the consequences of their actions. You see them receiving the consequence, consequences of their actions. Now, I, I sometimes wonder, um, when, when we're dealing with this text, if we ministers have done a disservice to this text by only reading this. When have you heard this text most often? Not often. I let me tell you, I read it at funerals all the time. Um, a new heaven and a new earth. There will be no more tears. God will wipe away the tears from our eyes. There will, there will be no more pain, no more mourning. Um, next to the twenty-third Psalm, next to John chapter eleven and John chapter fourteen, uh, let not your hearts be troubled. Um, this text is the most requested text read by families at funerals. And I understand why. Oh my gosh, it's beautiful. God will wipe away the tears from our eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be suffering and pain and crying, for the former things have passed away. It is beautiful. It is comforting. But in some ways, we have associated this text only with heaven. Some far off place, the eternal, the promise for us in eternal life, when that's not what John was saying at all. This is a promise for us now. And, and um, if, you, if you notice that in the scripture, and I want you to go back and read it more carefully when you go home today. It doesn't say, like the pictures that some revelationists show about, you know, God descending, Jesus descending on the clouds and everybody dying on earth and, and, and all these souls uh, raptured into heaven, yes, there are 144,000 of those 
who will be, and that's a long story, and we'll get into that another time. Maybe we should do a study of Revelation as a sermon series. But the, the main point of the, the book of Revelation is in this particular text. God does not demolish the earth. God, God does not bring everybody up to heaven who's good. God makes God's home on earth. The scripture in the, you heard it here in the message, um, God moved into the neighborhood and made his home with men and women. The RSV version says God comes down and dwells on the earth. Dwell, the word dwell in Greek means pitches a tent. God pitches a tent right next door to us, right next to us. God doesn't say all nature is wrong and rotten. God doesn't say that all humanity is irredeemable. God still sees the creation that God made and says it is good. I still see that glimmer of hope. And for those who, who break my trust and those who warp the goodness, there will be consequences. But for those who work for the good, for Christ, there will be a new neighbor. In fact, the neighbor's already with us, creating and co-creating with us this new creation. It's such a beautiful, beautiful word of hope. It's, it, it, it affirms our world and our creation. That's why I'm so glad tonight we're going to get a chance, Douglas Ann mentioned, to listen to one of the most beautiful works of musical art at 7.30 tonight, Haydn's The Creation. And it starts out, the oratorio starts out describing this sense of, of what it's like to live in chaos, just like in Genesis, in chaos. And it's this cacophonous noise that as the music goes on and on and the angels sing out and God's word brings life into being and God says it's good, this is such a reminder, especially at this time. You know, I, I, I talked about this um, with Keith, that it really does seem to me that this is a lanyap moment tonight. Do you know what lanyap is? Have you ever heard that word? L-A-G-N-I-A-P-P-E. It's French. It's French Louisiana. I've only heard it down in Louisiana. A lanyap moment is one of those Surprise blessings. It's like when you get a box of donuts and you've ordered a dozen and you find that there's a 13th donut in there. Land yet. When you, um, when you have something wonderfully that you happen that you're not expecting uh, or a coincidence, a moment of serendipity, um, what I call a God moment, a God thing. This is a God thing that's happened tonight because Keith had planned this moment. I can't for how far back we've been had the creation um, on the schedule. But we had no clue that at the end of April we would need to have some word sung and lifted up like a fist of, of power that says those who break creation, those who try to harm creation, who hurt us and all there is, we sing of God's goodness in the face of it. That's the power of the music that we're going to hear tonight. I sure hope you invite your friends to come to reclaim this new creation that is being made in spite of us each and every day. Because God does come and dwell among us. God's power is here, whether we see it or not, whether we continue to drive with blinders on or not. A, a couple of years ago, it was in 2003, I was still living in Tucson, Arizona, um, and it was the summer of the historic Mount Lemmon fire. Uh, we're not still sure whether it was human-caused or whether it was a lightning strike, summer lightning strike, but the, the whole mountain 
that encircled the city caught on fire. And those beautiful ponderosa pines where we would go in the heat of summer to go and find respite were burned to charred ash. And every night I would go out in my backyard and 9,000 feet below the tip of the mountain and just almost cry at the destructive um, power of that fire that was taking away all my places of beauty and my retreat where I would go and, and get away from it all. Um, but then once the fire was contained and our church went up after, after a Sunday morning worship and each of us had brought something, whether it was a seedling pine or strapling pine or a, um, a wildflower seeds, we went up and we began the process of replanting. And we knew that in our lifetime, we would never see the results of our labor. We knew that it would be uh, generations down that would be able to enjoy the forest that we had once enjoyed. But still we planted with hope. Last year I got a chance to go back to Tucson to celebrate the 50th anniversary of that congregation there. And Don and I went up the mountain. And friends, the trees were already beginning after nine years to grow into the, into the hint of what I knew that they would be. They're just amazing in their strength and in their power already lifting their arms to and I could see how God's creative renewal and regeneration, that new creation was at work. And that's what God does all the time. You hear about it already in those places of ash in Boston and the stories of hope and the creation that moves on in West. And I bet even in your own life. It's not a glimpse of heaven, friends. It's a glimpse of heaven on earth. Right now. Right here. This is the good news of the Lord. May you hear it, believe it, trust it. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite us now to make ourselves aware as we move into communion of the evidence of creation in this very room. I want you to be aware of the people who are sitting here. And I want you to take time before you leave today to really look at what a wonderful, wonderful beauty God has created in each and every one of you. I want you to look at this beautiful table where Rebecca has given to us that which is dried, but which reminds us of the beauty of God's world, surprising us. This table is set for us. And I'm realizing Robert Hearn is not here today. I might even know. Do I have anyone who would come up and join me at the table? I guess Mark Alexander is our go-to elder. Will you just say a word and pray for this table? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, love you so much, and, and we know that you love us. We thank you for this day, this day to think about your creation, to see the changes each and every day when we go outside of new life, new rebuilding, not just in nature, but in people's lives as well. And we thank you, Lord, for being with us, always there by our side, and helping us down life's path. We remember today your wonderful gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, shared of that ministry uh, that we still learn about each and every day here. And 
remember, especially at this table, his life of taking this bread, a symbol of his body, and this blood, a symbol of our sins forgiven. <coughs> Thank you, Lord, for sharing his life with us on this earth and helping us really know that you exist in this world. These things we ask you.